of my heart Cause you found it, you freed me Held back the waters for my release Oh Yahweh, sing this with me You're the God who fights for me, Lord I'm
darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see 
Michael and I were doing some ministry on the other side of the state, and during that time, we decided to take a quick trip up to Bronner's Christmas store. The, it's the, um, their claim, it's the world's largest. I, I certainly would hope so, because there's certainly uh, a lot of Christmas. Um, well, on the way up there, we noticed as we traveled that the leaves had already turned, and since then, they're turning here too. We still have a lot of green, but they're turning, and so it is spectacular when the sun hits the, the oranges and the reds. I mean, it's just beautiful what, uh, what can happen color-wise when it comes to uh, the fall foliage, as we say. So I was thinking about that, and, and uh, you know, I, also I noticed the cornfields, uh, the last harvest where they cut down the stalks, and we also saw huge farms of pumpkins, and even with the Halloween over, the last few pumpkins have been put out on a discount really half price many of them and as people buy them now for the Thanksgiving season to decorate. So I'm not a big Halloween fan, you know, to each, to each their own. We don't make a big deal about it as a family. Um, but I mean, our grandkids, they do their thing, but uh, we do love the harvest season. And so if you watch what happens, uh, the season kind of morphs into Halloween and then morphs into more of a Thanksgiving bounty harvest mentality. And we love the harvest season in our home. We're, uh, the harvest comes and we begin to count our blessings of all that God has done for us. And of course, it's always good to do it throughout the year. But there's something about harvest time when you see the trucks and uh, filled with all the different vegetables uh, that we're reminded in the fall of, that we're so blessed. Noticing things uh, around us is important when we communicate, especially we want to use things as illustrations or analogies. Jesus was really good at that. Was, I believe Jesus was the greatest teacher that ever lived. But it wasn't like he had notes that he thought, well, you know, I'm going to be out in the fields, so I'm going to talk about fields, or I'm going to be, I'm going to be by a river, so I'm going to mention the river of life. No, he would just look and see as he was teaching, and we'd bring the, those things around him into his message. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, it says, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness. So we know he was teaching and he was ministering. He was working. He was after it. And seeing the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast, like sheep without a shepherd. Now, why would sheep be downcast? Why would sheep without a shepherd be downcast. We're going to look at that today. He proclaims that and he says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. See, the Lord was using uh, many of the people that were farmers, certainly if they were not big estate farmers, but they grew their own food. They knew it was like to make a harvest from a crop. They also knew, or they were uh, around animals. So we've been to Israel a couple times. We see the nomads and the shepherds. So animals were, it's not like now. They're often animals lived them real near, right around the house and all. They understood what shepherding was. They understood what, what farming was. And so the Lord uses these analogies as he looks out on the crowd. And he has, and the Bible says he has compassion. Multiple times throughout the Gospels when referencing Jesus, whether you see sick people or hungry people or hurting people, the Bible says he looked on them with compassion, or he had compassion for them. That's an interesting word. And so we want to look at what, what is Christ-like compassion? If we're going to be followers of Jesus, what does it to mean to have a Christ-like compassion? We know that Jesus was a man of compassion. He was moved by compassion. He ministered by compassion. And he also, when he saw people that, that were in need or hurt or were ostracized or oppressed, he let that compassion move him toward them. So his ministry, his movement was toward people. He didn't just sit back. He didn't just hold back He and say, well, isn't that too bad? No. He, when he saw the need, he met the need. And so in order to be have compassion, let's look at the definition. One of, it's sympathy, pity, and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. It's not enough just to have to be sad or pity them. But if we're going to have Christ-like compassion, we need to address whatever it is that is causing them to be hurt, to be oppressed, to, to uh, need healing, to need ministry. And so as we keep that definition in mind, that sympathetic pity and or concern for the sufferings or misfortunes 
of other people. Christ had compassion for the harassed, the helpless, the distressed, and the dispirited. And you can add any synonyms that you would like to that. He, 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 was not, he didn't just surround himself with the quarterbacks and the cheerleaders and the successful people, even though he was able to speak their language too. But he, he looked for people that were hurting. He saw a need, and the need was the call. You can see that throughout the Gospels. And so as he saw that, it, always, it wasn't enough just to see the need. He went out and did his best to meet the need. So if you and I are going to have Christ-like compassion, we have to be willing to move in the, into that need. And when we do that, sometimes, you know, we go into the place, it's not always the best. It's not always the, it's not always the cleanest. It's not always the nicest. We get, our, we get our feelings involved. We get our hands dirty. We, get our, we, get our heart, we, get, we can have our heart hurt. Uh, there could be some pain involved when you minister. But if we're going to get down and be involved with people who are hurting, then we have to be willing to get dirty, to get involved, to get close. That's what Jesus did. First, he references them as people as sheep. And, you know, we've heard uh, many times people talk about this is the Christmas season. So well, I'm going to be talking about shepherds in a couple of weeks in detail and what it meant to be a shepherd. But just as a little study here, you know, the idea is uh, a sheep is not the smartest animal. I'm told by people who are experts in this field, I'm not, that they're not the smartest. And that's why uh, it, there's a shepherding that's involved and, and for safety purposes, uh, to be able to guide them, keep them away from uh, valleys and uh, potholes and things in life. And so uh, uh, Jesus said that sheep are, uh, they're like sheep, meaning that they were harassed and they were helpless in one of the translations. Now think about that. They were harassed by the religious leaders of the day that was using legalism and law to oppress them in such a way that they couldn't, they didn't have the liberty uh, of, of having a healthy relationship with God. And so those, those leaders were, were uh, not helping them. They were hurting them. They're making it harder for them. And so, so here comes the Lord, and he, he sees that. He sees these, these, these Jewish people just on the weight of law and religion and, and uh, the Pharisees, and his heart is moved to compassion. And so he begins to minister to them. And even though he was, his heart was broken, he begins to minister to them. And then, and then he also note, he says that I am in John 10, 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. So sheep with a good shepherd are protected. Sheep without a shepherd are unprotected. And so if we're going to have compassion and we're going to be like Christ, we need to look at people who, for whatever reason, are unprotected. In other words, they're, they're not being taken care of. They're not their, their spiritual needs aren't being met. The primary role of the church is spiritual needs. Along the way, though, we do our best. Uh, we here we have a food pantry. Um, uh, we have uh, we've done community Christmas dinners. We we um, have a benevolence ministry. Why do we do that? We do that in a practical way to expose God's love to people, to expose our ministry. But our ultimate goal is spiritual health. The gospel, good news, is spiritual health. And no social program is, can substitute for spiritual health. What I mean by spiritual health, I mean is the new birth, the miracle of the new birth. The gospel is the good news that Jesus has come to give life and give it more abundantly. That's the shepherd, the good shepherd. And the Bible says he's so good that he's willing to lay down his life for the sheep. When it comes to ministry, there's a sacrifice to ministry. If you're going to minister and care for people, you know, you may not be asked to literally lay down your life, but you're going to be inconvenienced, I guarantee it. You get involved with hurting people, needy people, people that society has cast aside, and you are going to be inconvenienced. But it's worth it, because if we love like Jesus, if we live like Jesus, and we have compassion like Jesus, then we can be used by Jesus to minister to hurting people. Well, if it's not enough to be a shepherd and a sheep, I believe the Lord probably saw some sheep over here, and he said, I'm the good shepherd and said, uh, and he's moved because he knows that they're like sheep. But he also, he recognizes that he sees people as the harvest. In other words, we go from a flock to a field. And I believe the Lord looked over at him. He's looking at the sheep maybe over here. And, and he was, you know, he used that to teach the heart of a good shepherd and, and that he had compassion. And then he sees a field and, he, and the, probably the field was ready to be to be harvested. Early fall, perhaps. Their fall, when their harvest time was. 
He goes on to say that the harvest is plentiful. You know, our country, our town here in Three Rivers and our country and our region, we try to minister uh, to uh, have a vast ministry. We, we minister to our missionaries all around the globe. And, and boy, when we see how many, how many millions of people there are, so many people need Jesus. And if we're not careful, sometimes we can get discouraged because uh, we're not seeing it, uh, the harvest coming into the barn, so to speak, or into the church. But Jesus said so many years ago, he said, the harvest is ripe. The harvest is ripe. And so if the harvest is plentiful, as he said in Matthew 9, 37, what's the problem? Well, the first thing he said to us is we need to pray that we have a heart of compassion. He didn't say that I'm all about witnessing. I think it's great to go out. We've given out Bibles. We've done that. But he said, pray, prepare your heart. Pray for a heart of compassion. Harvest hearts, I call them. Hearts that care about others are willing to get dirty, are, ready, are willing to get involved, are willing to sacrifice, are willing to be inconvenienced. That's not a natural heart. In other words, when, when we come into the kingdom, yes, we become new creatures, but it's very easy along the way to start thinking about ways we need to be ministered to, and, and we do, ways that, that the God can bless us, and he does. But we also want to make sure that we develop a harvest heart, or a heart for the harvest, meaning that we see opportunities at the workplace, at the ball field, at the high school, at the shopping mall, if we still have shopping malls, but within our lives, that we see people, unchurched people, not, not as just wicked, evil, dirty, rotten people, the way some, some have described them, but we see them as ready to be harvested. In other words, they're ready to hear the good news of Jesus. They're ready to hear my testimony and yours about what Christ has done for us. And so they're ripe for the harvest. They're ready to be harvested. But we got to pray. Our hearts have to be right. If our hearts aren't right, if we're not in tune with God, if we're not ready to, to have a good relationship with the Lord and ready to share, then we'll, we'll miss it. What we'll see is the inconvenience, we'll see the trouble, we'll see the sin, we'll see the meanness, we'll see the hurt, how they've hurt us maybe, but we won't see them as ready to be harvested. I believe God can change our hearts. I believe if we pray and ask God to use us and keep us tender for lost people, that God wants to give us, each of us, a heart for the harvest. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 37, clearly that the harvest truly is plentiful. Well, that's good news. Wow. I mean, that great if you had an apple tree and you looked out and there was a bunch of apples on it or you had a field of pumpkins and it was packed with pumpkins, you'd, see, you'd say, wow, fantastic. But there's a problem. In the next sentence, he says what the problem is. He says, but laborers are few. And then he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray then. Well, actually, uh, the NSAB says, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers in the field. What are we saying? We're saying that we need people who have a heart for the harvest. If you have a heart for the harvest, you'll head to the field. I mean, that's not the issue. But if our heart's not for the harvest, if our heart's for just our own our own life and our own family and situations, then we can miss the harvest. Instead, the Lord knows that the harvest is ready. It's right. It's time. And I believe God, here at New Hope Assembly of God in Three Rivers, Michigan, and in all the full gospel churches around the world, that our world is hurting. People are suffering. People are oppressed. The harvest is ripe. It's plentiful. There's people, they, they, don't, they don't know how to receive Christ. They don't understand how much God loves them. Maybe they think they've gone too far, done too much, been too sinful. But we know that's not true. We know that if, they're, if they will confess their sins, if they will believe in their heart, that Jesus is who he said he was and put their faith in God as their Lord and Savior, that their sins, though the scarlet, can be made white as snow. You know how I know that? Because that's what Jesus did in my life. And if you're a believer, that's what he's done in your life too. I'm grateful for the blessings, and I think we should count our blessings at, at the harvest time. I think Thanksgiving is a time where certainly we, we my goodness, if you, if you can't count your blessings with all the Thanksgiving uh, movies and posters and emails and talk about that, then you're not, never going to do it. However, as we're counting our blessings, that should make us, and we're thankful for what God's done in our life. That should make us be like Jesus and be moved to compassion. See those people who have yet to make Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We need to do that. A church that does that, that cares and prays,
and prays and works and then and then notice as you're praying for people to get involved in the harvest know that God might want to use you in ways that you've never been used before harvest hearts have always been needed all the way back to Jesus time all the way through my years of ministry we've always needed more workers more volunteers more people to care more people to share I believe that's always going to be that way our job is to pray that our hearts are right and then pray that God will move on the hearts of others to go into the harvest field we have to beware of, of procrastination I almost said the word that would have been funny procrastination that's a word that of course we know what that means of putting stuff off putting stuff off and the Lord gives us a warning there he says John in John chapter 4 verse 35 do not say there's still four months and then comes the harvest Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the field, for they're already white for harvest. Hallelujah. They're ready. Now's the time. Now's the time to share. Now's the time to care. Now's the time to show God's love and compassion. Not come to, well, when I when I you know do a little better, when I have a little more money, when I no, 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 no. If you get the heart right, don't worry about the tools. If our heart's right, God will give us a Holy Spirit will help us be creative. We'll have ways to communicate God's love and our story of what Christ has meant, meant to us. God, if, as long as we want to do it, if it's our heart to do it, God will show us how. The Holy Spirit will give us innovative ways, maybe that have never been done before. But don't give up on people. Stay positive. Keep the faith. Don't That person you've been praying for or that area of your, maybe where you work or go to school, don't give up. Keep praying. Keep asking God to help you. Keep loving people. Keep caring. Don't see them as just lost losers. See them as a ripe white harvest ready ready to be harvested so what lessons do we learn from this message today i haven't kept you long and i just want you to grab a hold of this and really sink your teeth into this you and i we need to make sure that we've developed a heart for lost people i think in the church world sometimes if we're not careful and i'm glad for every ministry every ministry that strengthens people encourages christians helps discourage uh, believers. We need to do all those things. Conflict resolution, all those things are so powerful and important, but we should make sure that we ask God to develop us and maintain a heart for the harvest. I want to be known as a soul winner. I want to be telling people about Jesus. I don't just want to come to church and learn stuff and, and maybe grow, grow, grow my information about the Bible, all those things are good, but that's not enough. I want, to, I want to lead people. I want to win people to Christ. I want to share my faith just out of my natural conversation because I have a heart for the harvest. We also then need to pray to see the harvest. What I mean by that is in our busy world, we can get so caught up that it's not that we don't care. It's just that we don't see it. We're so packed in our schedules and in our in our daily schedules and in, find out our weeks. And certainly during the holiday season, my goodness, so many things can be stacked in that we, we don't even see it. We just see the crowd and the noise and the traffic. And wait a minute, wait a minute. That's the harvest. God help us to pray. Lord, keep my eyes on the harvest. Help me to see lost people, people that need you, people that are distressed and discouraged, to see them like you see them. See, we need to pray for workers to partner in the harvesting. I believe if you're, whatever church you're going to, if you're going to a full route, you need workers. And so we need workers. We pray a lot that people would, you know, we, we don't try to grow our church from other churches, but we do ask God to send us workers from, from within our group, but also people that come into our fellowship that, that will help us with the harvesting. That's what Jesus said to do. He said, pray. I, I read it to you earlier. He said, pray or plead in, in one version. That's a powerful, and you're pleading with the Lord to, to, of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest, meaning that, that our family here and your church family, if you go to a different church, would then have the workers they need to have a great harvest. We need to pray that people's hearts will turn. We want to lead the way by example too, by the way, but also we, we want to pray for others. We need to be workers if we're going to pray for workers. And then seek to sell them. Luke 15, 10 says, Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You know, just think of it like a tree, you know. <laughs> if you're harvesting apple, you get one apple, pop. 
Well, normally I've done that I, out farm. We don't go, yay, look at it. We just put it in the bag and grab another one. But the Bible says that if you just can influence one. Some of us don't take on a task or a message like this because we think, wow, I can't. No, no, no. Just think of one. One apple. One orange. Harvest one. You may not have an impact where you're filling baskets and baskets, but one at a time. Who's God laid on your heart when it comes to harvest? Who's God laid on your heart when it comes to leading someone to Jesus? If the Bible says there's joy in the presence of the angels, then it'll be joy in our presence when we lead. Could you imagine sharing your story about what Jesus did for you this holiday season? Why are you, what do you got to be thankful for if somebody asks you? Well, I'll tell you what I got to thank for. I've given my life to Jesus Christ, and he has cleansed me, washed me, and I've never had the peace like I have now. Boom, there you go. How about that, huh? That's a great thing right there. You don't have to have be a Bible uh, scholar. Share your story. I, I implore you, share your story. And you watch, and, but you got to live it. You can't be an old sourpuss, a lemon, someone like always sucking on lemons and tell somebody you're a Christian. Why would anybody want that? No. Nope. If you will have the joy of the Lord, and then you can celebrate when you influence somebody through your story of what Christ has done for you, that can happen this season. What a great gift that would be to you and me if we could lead somebody, show somebody the way to the cross, and have them accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Let's seek to celebrate this year. Because a harvesting heart, listen to me, I don't know, I don't know, people who are ministering are happy people, but people that are deliriously happy are when somebody they love or somebody they know or maybe somebody they recently met but that they influence somebody with their life to live for Jesus Christ. That's the high, I mean, that's, that's second to only, to only you accepting Jesus Christ yourself is to influence somebody for the kingdom of God. Develop a heart for the lost. Pray to see the harvest and not just be so filled with your schedule. Pray for workers to come in and partner with us in harvesting. Celebrate it. As for every apple, every every potato, <laughs> I mean, one at a time. We don't have to have a crowd. COVID has kept us certainly from the crowds we once had, but each person celebrate and, and have that harvesting heart. And I believe you're going to have, when you get to a place where your, your greatest joy, the thing you're most thankful for is that you led someone else to the Lord, you'll never go back. You'll, you'll want to do it again and again and again. Let's be like Jesus. Let's have compassion on hurting people, lost people, people that have been uh, oppressed or have been outcast, people that are, are uh, you know, helpless, dispirited. God gives us a heart for them. I don't want to get so caught up in the bells and the whistles and the wrapping and the packages and the, the carols and the, and the Thanksgiving turkey that I miss out. But God's placed me here. For people. You know what Barney tells us? I'll close with this and then we'll pray. This this season, people are more open to discussing what we're talking about. Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life than any other time of the year. How about you add your story to his story and share it. Get in on the harvest. Let's have a heart for harvest. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Give us a heart for the harvest, I pray, God. Help us, God, to always be looking for ways to increase your kingdom, God. Lord, forgive us for times that we've had our head in the sand, or we, it's not that we didn't know, maybe that we didn't care, Lord, it's just that we didn't, we weren't looking right. So help us to keep our eyes open, to see the fields, to see the sheep, God, and to want to be a shepherd like you, and to be a harvester like you, God. Give us workers, I pray. Give every church, every person here, God, it speak to our hearts about being part of the harvesting process, I pray. May it start in our hearts. We thank you for it by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God loves you. And so do I.